Here we go, Outfield Tears. Welcome in to Fantasy Baseball Today. Frank Scott and Chris here on Thursday, January 25th. Today on the show, we're breaking down all the Outfield Tears, even the ones that have 25, 40 names inside of them. Finally get to some of that extra news. And we didn't get to talk about the Hall of Fame yesterday, so I think if we have time, we'll wrap up with that a little bit later on. Scotty, Outfield, yes. as we've talked about all offseason, Trying not to pay as much attention to position scarcity, but outfield does make it pretty hard. Lots of talent up top inside of the top 24. The middle part of it all right, gets a little bit murky. And then I think there are some pretty fun names going later on in drafts. So uh, how are you feeling about outfield right now? Terrible. Uh, it's, I mean, there are basically two positions worth paying attention to in drafts this year, and it's outfield and starting pitcher. And really, those are the two I'm that my that I'm strategizing around that's that's really what my whole draft strategy is based around and in outfield's case it's just because of the astonishing lack of talent relative to the infield positions where we talked uh what was it just yesterday about second base how I'm thinking about skipping a tier there well I didn't have to think very hard about it at all in the outfield um, there is no also elite tier in the outfield. There's just the first rounders. And then I made an extra special tier above that just for Ronald Acuna. Um, but that also elite tier, kind of the second, third round range in drafts, maybe second, third, fourth round range. Just nobody worth drafting there. Somebody will get drafted there, but they won't deserve to because they belong in a lower tier with players who go later. So, I mean, the flip side of that is that there are, uh, and I may be jumping ahead too far for your liking, Frank, let me know if I am. There are nine outfielders who should probably be drafted in round one, early round two at the latest. And I wonder, given the drop-off after that, and the drop-off that comes after around 24-25 in the outfield rankings, which is really where the infield positions begin to distinguish themselves from the outfield positions. So given those two huge drop-offs, I wonder if it's so important to draft an outfielder from that top tier, from those, those nine first-round caliber hitters, that you should just do it. Like, no, like maybe, maybe I shouldn't have Bobby Witt as my number two two overall player uh, because of that. Maybe maybe Jordan Alvarez has to go ahead of Corey Seager because of that. It's it's something I'm wrestling with even now, and I would like more mocks to see how it plays out. I gave myself the second overall pick in, in the last mock we did just so I could say take Bobby Witt and see how it turned out, and it went okay, but I think I had some good fortune to make it go okay, and I'm not I'm not totally sold on on having wit second overall just because he doesn't play the outfield. And you could talk yourself into that, Scott, using those nine players you talked about that are first round caliber outfielders. There are different points in the first round where you can make that argument, right? Like you just said, Julio over Bobby Witt, where Freddie Freeman goes, you could talk yourself into Kyle Tucker or Fernando Tatis or Juan Soto going ahead of Freddie Freeman. And uh towards the back end, you can say, All right, I want Jordan Alvarez over somebody like Bryce Harper or Matt Olson or Jose Ramirez. So there I are mean, different points in the first round where you can make that argument. I, I think the conversation we had yesterday kind of highlights the point, which is if you're drafting Mookie Betts in the first round, you're drafting him as an outfielder. Almost. I mean, not guaranteed, but you're probably drafting Mookie Betts as an outfielder. In a five outfielder league, I would think, it. Think back. League. Think back two years. And the idea of playing a guy willingly at outfield ahead of second base would have been unthinkable. Mm -hmm. So I, I think that just highlights the, the, the lack of star power. And really it's not even the, the, the lack of star power, I guess it's the wrong way to put it. It's There's the lack a ton of, of stars, but... everything but star <laughs> at the position, you know, it, yeah. it, it's, it's like that top nine is awesome. And, and I, I, I quibble a little with the, there shouldn't be anyone in the second or third round, but I have one outfielder 
in that range. So like in my, if I was doing the also elite tier, it would be one guy. And then we'll, we'll talk about him. That Say who it would be. Friends, I want to get, a, I want to get my response ready. Say who it would be. He, he has two first names. Uh, I also have that exactly on the rundown, Scott. So if you want to oh, cheat that a little bit, you will find, yeah, that's who we're talking about. Let's get into the tiers. The unmatched one name, Ronald Acuna. So good. I had to create a tier just for him. Because he broke fantasy. He hit 337 with 41 homers, 73 steals, 149 runs scored. And according to the Rasball Player Raider, Ronald Acuna earned $70 worth of auction value in a 12 team league. The next closest player was Matt Olson at $46.6. And if you look at the head to head points format on CBS, Acuna scored 817 fantasy points. The next closest was Freddie Freeman at 666.5. So, the unmatched here, I don't know that there's much to add. I mean, we had a conversation about this recently. I don't, the last time there was a player this unquestioned as the number one player was probably Mike Trout like a decade ago or something like that. Yeah. And, and I'll, I'll add in some, some other data to, to color this. I, I went through and I did, um, well, we'll talk about it in the future. And I'm going to have some pieces on CBSports.com, but basically the, what you needed to win your league last year for a Roto League uh, data. And one thing that I found really interesting was there was a higher correlation between where the first place team finished in stolen bases and runs scored than usual last year. I think that's mostly just because Ronald Acuna was such a standout because usually stolen bases is by far the lowest correlation between winning your league and winning the category. Usually teams that win their league on average finish between third, closer to fourth place in stolen bases, which makes sense. Stolen bases are their own thing. They don't correlate to anything else all that strongly. Whereas if you do really good in home runs, you're probably going to do pretty well in runs and RBI too. Last year, Ronald Acuna was such a dominant fantasy force that, the average team, I mean, it wasn't a significant gap. It was like the average winning team in a Roto League finished 3.5 in uh, stolen bases, but usually that's like 3.8, 3.9. And so he he was just, he, he kind of reshaped the fantasy landscape on his own in a way that is incredibly rare for one player to do. It kind of feels like whoever has the first pick this year should have a third round reversal. Right. Like we used to do uh, in, in fantasy football in like the late nineties, yeah. early two thousands when like Ladanian Tomlinson was just so much better. That was, that was a real thing. in in a lot of high stakes fantasy football in early two thousands. So I got a bone to pick with both of you based on this. We came out last week with our salary values, like our auction values for, uh, for every player, obviously. Mm -hmm. And I remember we had a conversation before that. Okay, so Acuna was worth $70 basically last year. What's the lowest we could have him as in, according to those values? And I, I thought we arrived at about 60 so that's what I put Acuna as. And then they come out, and Frank's got Acuna at 52. Chris, you have him at 49. Yeah, I got him. I'm, I'm, I'm increasing him. I'm increasing it. It's fine. Okay. I uh, so. But you are correct, yes projections let me see i'm just kind of messing around here on the fly let's see atc projections from our buddy ario cohen are out they're live on uh, fan grass and i think they're on sports line too if you want to check them out ronald acuna in a 12 team league projected for 54.6 dollars so i probably could bump him up a little bit definitely over 50 i mean that's i, I mm -hmm. i'll, I'll I'm, say i'm moving him up to 55 in response to this the, the disparity there i put out a twitter poll asking people does uh, would you be willing to pay fifteen dollars more for Acuna than the number two player in in such a scenario? And the majority said yes. Now I, I think all it took was like twenty percent saying yes mm -hmm. for you to rest assured it's going to happen in your league. Acuna is going to go for fifteen dollars more than the next player. Yeah, but the majority said yes. So yeah, it's going to happen in every league. And I I don't think we want to belabor the point too much. I if that happens, I'm probably out. Like, probably a sixty dollar player. Like, there are there are too many ways things can go wrong. And obviously, look, 
there are as many ways for things to go wrong as for as Acuna. Like, basically, he gets hurt, right? Like that's the only way things go wrong for him. But like, Probably. sixty dollars is is. A hey, I've spent sixty dollars on players before. Right, one, sure, sure, one, and we and we've all been in drafts where where players get inflated. The thing about that though is, if we're ranking him, if we're saying he's a fifty five dollar player, well, uh, most right. leagues the guys we have as forty four dollar players or whatever tend to go for fifty five in a you're, lot of you're, drafts. You're trying to be level headed, so that means level headed to start your going own like, detriment. Ronald Acuna is going to go for sixty five in some leagues. Oh, yeah. oh, it's gonna, it's gonna happen. And he should for sure, and uh, that's gonna be really hard no. to to justify, right? But that that's what he should go for a price that is really hard for yes. the majority of the league to justify. Yeah, and if you somehow get the first overall pick in your draft this year, just based on however you figure out draft picks, you should thank your lucky stars that you're getting Ronald Acuna on your team. Let's move on to the first rounders here. Eight names here: Julio Rodriguez, Corbin Carroll, Mookie Betts, Kyle Tucker, Fernando Tatis. Aaron Judge, Juan Soto, and Jordan Alvarez. Also for fun, Shohei Otani would be in this tier. He's listed on this tier on the in this tier on the website. He's going to go around this range in most drafts as well. Uh, this ADP kind of ranges from picks three through seventeen. If we look at uh, NFBC ADP, Scott, if we are talking about a head-to-head points league, I know that you rank these tier. You rank the players within these tiers as well. My guess is the top three would be Betts, Judge, and Soto. Does that sound right? Uh, Betts, Judge, and so- Soto. Yeah, that's that's exactly how I have it in points leagues. Same. All right. Um, so it does change a little bit there, and we did a head-to-head points mock draft recap maybe a month ago, and we talked about some of the really big differences just throughout the draft, but really up top focusing on how much a draft can train uh, change this year between yeah. head-to-head points and right. Bro- there are so many first round caliber hitters. I said it before. There's 17 that I, I think there is more room for distinction between the two scoring formats than, than I can remember. And my rankings vary more as a result. Yeah. And, and I think the one, the way you can think about it, like if better hitters, hitters, not stolen bases, but just what they do as hitters bump them up in points leagues. I, I think that's the, the best way to think about it. So you got like, Corbin Carroll, Julio Rodriguez, Bobby Witt, they're really good hitters, but they're like mid 800s OPS bats right now. Yeah. Judge Soto, you know, those guys are, are mid 900s OPS bats. Yeah, I would at least, I would say there's a pretty clear correlation between OPS or even WRC plus and Mm -hmm. fantasy points. There's just, you know, it weights more things like walks, obviously where, you know, someone like Bobby Witt or Julio Rodriguez, they don't walk all that much, but they mm-hmm. still have kind of bases. So that's that difference between, you know, Roto and a head-to-head points league. Uh, I asked a similar question yet question yesterday about Corey Seager, but Chris, I'll ask you this. How much do you worry about injuries with Jordan Alvarez, who right now is typically going at that one-two turn? He's missed 93 games over the past three years. That's 19% of all of his available games. 2021, it was. It seemed like it was mostly some COVID stuff. You know, had some mm-hmm. day-to-day injuries. 2022, he went on the IL with right hand inflammation. Last year, missed a ton of time with a strained oblique. Sometimes, for some of these bigger sluggers, something that could linger year over year. Uh, do the injuries worry you with Jordan Alvarez? I, I would say he probably has a higher baseline uh, injury talent. I don't know what the right way to frame that would be than most other players certainly in this tier but like it would be a little disingenuous of me to say oh, i can't draft Jordan alvarez but aaron judge is a top 10 pick you know like aaron judge's injury concerns are, are arguably even greater and you know we've seen what the one healthy season now in fairness the healthy aaron judge season was historically great and we haven't seen that from Jordan alvarez so i, but- I that's what but I, I was going to well, say, I, 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 thought, think, I thought you said yet, which yet I, yet would work too. I yeah. mean, I, I think like a 315, 50 homer season mm-hmm. is very much within the realm of possibility for yes. Jordan Alvarez to the point that I, I ex- more or less expect it to happen at some point in his career. It's just when will he have that year where he stays healthy enough for it to happen? Do you, do you guys consider Aaron Judge injury prone? Yes. Chris, he, he certainly has been injury prone. 
I I would push back. I think last year was very fluky with the toe injury. I mean, could have happened to anybody, right? Being a, a brick, whatever. There's like a brick block all around the outfield in the Dodgers stadium. Like it literally could happen to anybody. There is risk that the toe injury could linger this year. So Frank, you know who you sound like? He's not injury prone. You sound like me talking about Giancarlo Stanton like four years ago. Aaron Judge was mostly healthy in 2021. And he was very healthy for two years. Yeah. Yeah. And then last but year. Then there's 2020, 2019, and 2018. Yeah. All right. I, it's it's not even like Fluke it's injury. just that Aaron Judge weighs 280 pounds. Uh, like right. I think it's just really difficult to stay healthy when you're that big. And I think and that's been Giancarlo Stanton's career problem. And and look, I'm Alvarez. I'm the guy who doesn't care about it. So I'm not really downgrading those guys. But if we're going to talk about injury risk where it exists in the first round, I think those two have a a, a higher amount than well, th- than it does. But they're still worth, you know, I've got Jordan Alvarez more like I think he's 16 for me or 15 overall, something like that. I still think they're great players and well worth taking in this range. Yeah, I mean, we're we're quibbling. Uh, yes. Honestly, I, look, we all have them ranked inside the top 15 or 16 players anyway. The also elite tier, Scott mentioned up top, none, zero, zilch, nobody in the nobody. also elite tier. The near elite, 13 names, a ton here. Luis Robert, Mike Trout, Cody Bellinger, Adolis Garcia, Michael Harris, who I do see is featured on Scott's shirt today. Very nice. Randy Arozarena, Kyle Schwarber, Nolan Jones, Josh Lowe, Jazz Chisholm, Christian Yelich, Jackson Churio, and Wyatt Langford. Oh, so, yeah. Getting uh, greedy. First and foremost, each of Jones, Lowe, Jazz, Churio, Langford. They are one tier lower in a head-to-head points league. Combination it really changes of, the complexion, doesn't it? <laughs> combination of strikeouts for some skill set, you know, seals being more prevalent with some of these players. Maybe some playing time with some of these names as well. Uh, but it's a huge tier covering all different skills and experience levels, obviously. I was going to make the argument for two names that I thought could potentially be in that also elite tier. Probably not in a points league, but I could see it in a categories league. Luis Robert and Adolis Garcia. Mm-hmm. Garcia, top 20 overall player two years in a row. The problem is that the steals have now fallen off, so that sucks. Uh, Luis Robert just finished as a top 24 player last year. 38 homers, 20 steals. Had this huge prospect pedigree, finally put it together. But he also kind of has his warts injury concerns, and he's on a really bad team with the White Sox. So uh, I guess I made the case for and against Scott, but... Those are the two, Adolis Garcia and Luis Robert. I would make the argument for them to maybe be in that also elite tier. Yeah, I mean, if Luis Robert meets his upside, which he did last year, then then he would belong in that also elite tier, I think, by himself, only in categories leagues because in, in terms of points per game, uh, Luis Robert last year was <laughs> basically the same as TJ Friedel. So he's... You know, I, I think he's better than TJ Friedel, but um, th- his skill set is not uh, suited well for for points leagues. Um, but why I don't put Luis Robert in the also elite tier, even in Roto, is because I think the odds are very much against him having that best case scenario again for the reasons you already mentioned. Missed a lot of time with injuries in both 2022 and 2021. Last year was the first time playing even 100 games. And yeah, that lineup that lineup really drags down the counting stats. And and one thing that I've always made a point to argue about when we talk about these injury prone players is part of my problem with the way we discuss injury prone is we we contextualize so much about fantasy baseball. You know, Vladimir Guerrero played forty percent of his games in. Well, I can't remember what park it was. Central Florida somewhere, right? Dunedin. Dunedin. And then yeah. in Buffalo. And that's why, and and all and we we quantify so much. And then with injuries, it's just like we're like reading tea leaves and you fish guts and and you know, trying like there's nothing, there's nothing like scientific about it. And and I think Luis Robert is a good example of this because he has been dogged throughout his career by the injury prone tag. And this season, he probably will not be because he only missed, what was it, 20, 18 games last year or whatever? He, he played like 144? 145, yep. 
it's weird for me to be doing the, do you guys remember that this happened in September thing? But do you guys remember that Luis Roberts injury season came to a close six games early with a knee injury? I didn't. Now he only missed six games because it happened on September 23rd or whatever it was. Mm -hmm. If that happens in May, Mm -hmm. it was a, a, an MCL sprain. If that happens in May and he misses a month, all of a sudden it's, can't trust Luis Robert. It's the same injury. It just happened. Like he wasn't in control of when it happened. So this is a good example. Luis Robert's a good example of the, the unscientific way we tend to talk about injuries as a fantasy baseball community, not just well, I us don't, three. I don't know what scientific way you could do it, but is, isn't it true? And I, I don't know the research behind it, but it's a truism that the best predictor of injury is past injury. Yes. I I think the best way to phrase it is there is very little that can predict future injuries, but what is there past injuries would be a, a pretty helpful. Okay. Sure. I also want to say that the reason I'm harping more on Luis Robert for his injury history than Jordan Alvarez and Corey Seager is because Jordan Alvarez and Corey Seager have top five upside. Well, Luis Robert has top 25 upside. It's just the the reward isn't as worth the risk, I don't feel like. If he was on a better team, I would argue maybe he does have like top 10, top 12 upside. But, I mean, he just had a career year, 38 homers, 20 steals. He had 80 RBI yeah. in 145 games. The White Sox are going to be really, really bad. So I do think that's something you can hold against Luis Robert here. Scott, I did want to ask you about the back half of this here. Obviously, you know, some people hear some of the names here and, uh uh-oh, light bulb goes off. What are we talking about? Uh, So we've got guys like Nolan Jones, Josh Lowe, Jazz Chisholm, Jackson Churio, Wyatt Langford. Why are they included in this tier? Is it solely an upside play? Well, I feel like that's probably the, <laughs> is, is that the answer? Is it just the upside is the reason? Uh, so can you go through those names again? So I did not include Christian Yelich, who's at the back half okay. there, but like yeah, he's, some people, he's more of a floor play. Yeah. Some people will, will like hear again, like Nolan Jones, Josh Lowe, Jazz, Trio, yeah. and Langford. They're guys okay. that are not very proven or in Jazz's case, hasn't been able to stay on the field. Yeah. I was curious if you included him. Yeah. 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 I did. Yeah. Yeah. It's it's not just upside because, of course, y- you could find players further down in the tiers with comparable upside who, who, who also have the, the upside that could put them in this tier. But it's how confident I am in them meeting their upside. So I'm more confident, I guess, in some degree to, in, to some degree in Luis Robert meeting his upside than I am in Nolan Jones meeting his upside. But I already said I'm not. I'm not supremely confident in Luis Robert meeting his upside. And I wouldn't say I'm supremely confident in Nolan Jones meeting his upside, but I think that upside is similar. And I think they'll come pretty close to their upside. So, I mean, this is kind of the distinction between a tiers ranking system and just straight up ranking him. It's obvious Luis Robert needs to rank higher than Nolan Jones. Do I think their final production will be comparable? Yeah, I do. It's a better chance, Luis. Like, if, if one of them's going to finish higher, I'd put my money on Luis Robert. But ultimately, uh, Jones could finish higher. And I, I think it'll be pretty comparable. Yeah, the, the, I think this tier, one, this is already the part of the, the how field rankings where I, I start to get indigestion. And two, it, it, it feels like a really wide tier. To me, I'm not necessarily disagreeing that this is what the tier should be. I, I like I said, I would probably have Luis Robert and and maybe Michael Harris a tier ahead, but mm-hmm. th- this it's a wide range in the rankings, and and this kind of highlights why if I could get two in that first, you know, tier and a half, would feel a lot better about my chances. Uh, yeah, I, and I hear the Michael Harris thing and I want to put him higher, but I have counting stats concerns for sure. him, just like Absolutely. I do Robert because of where he's positioned in the lineup. Uh, you mentioned Adolis Garcia, Frank, 
there it's i feel like he's i feel like he's a liability in two categories certainly a liability in batting average and just underwhelming in stolen bases yeah relative to the other players you could draft in the same range so that's why i have him in this tier as opposed to making him a part of a very small also elite tier uh but those would I guess would be the three who you could, if you wanted to distinguish, you could maybe Mike Trout in a points league. You could do the same with him. I thought about that, but ultimately decided against it because his plate discipline isn't as good as it used to be. I think the biggest stretch we haven't mentioned, but Jackson Chorio and Wyatt Langford, I am showing supreme confidence in them by tearing them this high. But I, I think by the time spring training gets going and, and drafting is picking up, at, at, at full force, I think most people are going to be where I currently am on those two. Yeah, and that's part of what Chris was saying about this just being a wide range in within this tier because Luis Roberts' ADP was is around thirty. Right now, Trio and Langford are around one hundred and fifty and one hundred and sixty. But if Scott's those, right, those will move up. Yeah, yeah. But if yeah, Scott's right, and like we see these guys in spring training, they start hitting home runs. Like yeah, they're probably closer to the top 100 picks. They're going where like Anthony Volpe was going by the time we knew he was on the opening day roster last year. And like, I, I think we all agree. These are better prospects than Anthony Volpe. Yeah. Honestly, at this time last year, Volpe and Jordan Walker, I think we're still outside the top 200. Mm -hmm. And then think about how much they shot up, right? By the time we got mm -hmm. to mid March, they were top 120. Sometimes yeah, Walker was a top 100 guy. I think. Yeah, it was crazy stuff. Uh, before we take our first break, just, a few things to promote here. FBT is a finalist for the best baseball cat, uh, podcast category in the Sports Podcast Awards. And this is the final week to vote. Thanks to all of our listeners. We actually won the award last year, and now we're looking to go back to back. To help us bring home the hardware, you can find the link in the podcast and YouTube descriptions or scan the QR code on the top right corner of the screen. The whole process should take you less than a minute, and we would really appreciate it. Mailbag podcasts are starting up next week. And we have a new segment that we are introducing, Prospect Spotlight. So if you have a top prospect that you'd like us to evaluate, leave a five-star rating on Apple and drop the prospect's name in a review. And we'll choose one player to highlight in each of our future mailbags. Lastly, we have a bonus podcast that will be released on Friday this week. I am talking first-year player draft rankings and international signings with our buddy, the Welsh. Obviously, very useful for dynasty players, but maybe if you want to get ahead of the competition in your keeper league or redraft league, just these are names you're going to have to know at some point. Uh, you can obviously check that out on YouTube or wherever you We're listen. talking 2023 draft? The Yes. The first, I mean, year, first year player draft rankings for, I guess, 2024 yeah. leagues. There's, yeah. there's like three or four names from that that you're going to need to know for this year probably. And that also Well, one's includes, already debuted. And that also includes a, a handful of uh, the international guys that, that we need to know about. Yeah. Though I think I think the trend is toward fading those 17-year-olds that signed. But I, I just released my first-year player rankings, the top 30. And I have three of them, three of the international class in there. Um, I did not oh, sorry, include... sorry. No, I, I meant uh, like Yamamoto and, and oh, yeah. Yeah. Lee. Right. They're... They're both included. Yuki Matsui is included. Um, I did not include Nolan Shanwell, and I'm surprised because I see other first-year player rankings. I mean, wouldn't, wouldn't him debuting supersede his first-year stat? Like, are you not allowed in certain leagues to pick up a major league? Uh, a, a, a major leaguer just because he happened to be drafted? I don't know. I don't know how it works, but I left Nolan Shanwell out of my, or Shanuel. Is it two syllables or three? I left them out of my first-year player rankings. And uh, I'm not going to correct you, Scott, because I've heard it different ways. So <laughs> <laughs> still need to learn more about uh, old Nolan. We'll leave it there. Let's take our first break. When we return, the rest of Outfield Tears here on Fantasy Baseball Today. It's Welcome back in. Let's continue on with outfield tiers, and we are up to the next best 
things. Six names in this tier. Brian Reynolds, Spencer Steer, Seiya Suzuki, George Springer, Teoscar Hernandez, and Evan Carter. Okay. Ugh. So let me jump in real quick. Okay. The unmatched, there's one, Ronald Acuna. The first rounders, there's eight. The also elite, there's zero. The near elite, there was how many? 13. 13. And now here are the next best things. There's six. So this is the second drop-off I was referring to at outfield. And this is the bigger drop-off. This is where we get to that end of the end of that top 24, top 25. And the depth with at, at every infield position is so much better after this point. So this is uh, the tier is called the next best things. And it's really kind of your last it, it's really kind of your last chance to get a, a a quality outfield an outfielder you can really feel good about let's say and in most leagues i'd like to have three outfielders by the time we get to the end of this tier because i i i so hate what comes after and i think there's so much more value to be found at every other position yeah and i was going to say something really similar scott where i actually really like this tier and i think if you play in a deeper league, I want to have at least two outfielders by this point. But if you play in a 10 or 12 team league, three, let's try to have at least three outfielders by the end of this tier. Uh, Brian Reynolds and George Springer, they feel like floor raisers, you know, just what we should expect from them uh, and what they've you know done so far, obviously, in their careers. Suzuki and Evan Carter, I think there's breakout potential with both of those two names. Teoscar Hernandez, kind of a wild card here with the Dodgers. Spencer Steer, <laughs> uh, not as as much enthusiasm for me. Maybe it's different for you guys. Uh, but I thought you like Spencer Steer. I thought I was alone in the Spencer Steer bust. Uh, I don't know bandwagon. The bust just, bandwagon does not feel as exciting as any of the other names in this tier. Okay. Maybe I'm just being unfair to Spencer Steer. He obviously had a great season last year. Uh, yeah. But the one I wanted to focus on was Evan Carter. Such an interesting player to evaluate. Only 21 years old. Has huge prospect pedigree. Played 40 games last year between the regular and the postseason. Hit six home runs with six steals. Displayed a ridiculous eye at the plate. Basically did not swing at pitches outside of the strike zone. But somehow managed to strike out a lot. His BABIP was over 400. And he's been really bad against lefties in the minors. So, Chris, Evan Carter is... Uh, I, I use the word interesting. Complicated. I think that's probably... Not, like He feels kind of hard to... to Terrifying. Purchase. He feels hard to project moving forward, I would say. I, yeah, I think a lot of it is going to come down to how many bases he steals. Because I, I think he's going to be probably just a decent power hitter. Like, I, I don't want to put a ceiling on a player this young who who was as good as he was in the major league at the major league level last year. But, like, I'd be surprised if it was much more than 20 given the the quality of contact, given the minor league track record where he has 27 homers in 246 games, you start to pace that out. That's more like a 17 homer pace over a full season. He's really young. He succeeded at the major league level, but the quality of contact metrics. So like if he's not a 25 stolen base guy, it gets a little harder to see how he justifies this. You know, if you play in an OBP league, that might be different because he he should be very, very good in that format. But I just, I I think they're, I'm not likely to draft Evan Carter this year. You know I, who I, I guess feel like you, why I'm going to say it. You know who I feel like you just described though? It's a player from the previous tier, Christian Yelich. Uh, yeah, I think that's a decent comp. For for Evan Carter, yeah. Like what and, Christian Yelich is now. Right. And, you know, I, I called Christian Yelich in that previous tier where he was alongside Luis Robert and Michael Harris. I called him a floor play from that tier. And obviously nobody would call Evan Carter a floor play. He's not proven enough to have earned that. But he's a tier lower. And so... Mm -hmm. I had, I mean, Frank and I were talked about it a lot when he got called up last year. We were very skeptical of him being a fantasy asset right away because he seemed underdeveloped physically and the exit velocity readings weren't great and there just wouldn't be enough power. And he immediately proved us wrong in a pretty dramatic way. 
And by po- by postseason, you know, the Rangers obviously went on to win the World Series. So they had a long postseason run where they did quite well for themselves. And they they moved Evan Carter up to like third, fourth in the batting mm-hmm. uh, because of how much they valued his contributions. I think it's a diverse skill set. Um, and- obviously elevated by the on-base skills, obviously elevated by the fact he's a pretty good base dealer. I'm I'm not sure whether he's going to end up more of a 15 homer type or a 25 homer type, but I think there will be enough there. I, I think he'll either be like a, a something like a Christian Yelich or maybe a speedier Brandon Nimmo, or maybe even better that maybe. But the, there's a Michael Harris upside outcome. Yeah, sure, sure. Uh, no, and I'll admit I. I just kind of assumed that his price was a little closer to Christian Yelich, but that's not the case. He's going about 50 picks later. So that, that that does make me feel a lot better about it. Evan Carter around 125 overall, actually that seems fine. I thought the way he finished the year and what he did in the postseason, the ADP actually would be higher for Evan Carter. I did too. I I thought I, I was, I was trying not to overdo it in my rankings and I think I am higher than the consensus. He's, uh, uh, he's going behind, or yeah, he's going behind where like Jeremy Pena was mm-hmm. at this time last year. And obviously, Pena had a longer rookie season in addition to the big postseason. But I, I did th- assume that the postseason was going to push him a little higher than it ended up going. And so, I'll take that back. 125th overall ish. That that strikes me as pers- perfectly reasonable for Evan Carter. I think part of it is, you know, in the moment, obviously, we're just kind of reveling at everything that Evan Carter was doing. But then once the season ends and you see, all right, his BABIP was unsustainably high and Mm -hmm. the strikeouts and some of the split stuff. Like, yeah, he can improve, obviously. He's still so young and he does have that pedigree. But Mm -hmm. I don't know. I have questions about projecting the steals, too. Like, if he's batting cleanup, are they going to let him run? I I don't know if that's going to happen, man. So I I don't I don't think we're, I'm going to draft him. Where we're, he's going to we're, we're kind of going pretty far here with the Evan Carter analysis, sure. but like I mentioned, underdeveloped physically, he's what 21? Did he? Did mm-hmm. he just turn 22? I think he just you turned 21. At, you look at him and you see the potential for added muscle, and and what is that going to do for his exit velocities? I think, I think it remains to be seen, but there there could be upside yet to come exit velocity wise yeah Yeah. he doesn't turn 22 until august that's exactly right let's move on to the fallback options 24 names in this (laughs) tier including four util only bats that are in there here's what we're going to do kind of break it down six names at a time because obviously i'm not going to read off 25 names um the first six lane thomas marcelo zuna who is util only jordan walker nick castellanos jorge soler chas mccormick we spoke about Thomas and McCormick on our <laughs> Can These Breakouts Repeat episode. Uh, but Chris, I know you wrote up Jordan Walker as a breakout. Why is that? Well, I mean, I, I think the biggest part of it is just look what he where he was being drafted last year. Look at what he did after coming back. I know the, the production wasn't great from a fantasy perspective, you know, because the run in RBI told us especially, but like, he came back from the minors at the beginning of June and, and put up an 800 OPS the rest of the way. And it's worth keeping in mind. This is another guy who doesn't turn 22 until May. There are certainly things to to work on, and he's going a little bit ahead of uh, ahead of Evan Carter, which you know I, I'm not sure makes a ton of sense. But it's just it's a bet that this might be the last time you get Jordan Walker in, outside of the top 50. All right, let's slide over. Scott? You had interesting things to say there, Chris, but what makes Jordan Walker a, a breakout candidate is like the most obvious <laughs> question. Like obviously right, right. No, breakout that's, potential. Right. That's what that's he's kind of I I think a bit of a free space on the right. on the breakouts I, board I, where it, I almost put him in my breakouts 1.0, but it's like, what am I gonna say here? <laughs> right. Yeah, yeah, Nobody, I, I I don't have too much to say. It's just because right. you don't have a ton of tangibly to grab onto from last season like he didn't yeah he it's wasn't pro- it's projection basically right he wasn't horrible which mm-hmm. just being 20 
what, I think he was 20 when, when he made his debut, right? No, he's, uh, yeah, he was 20 when he made his debut. Being 20, getting sent down, handling that the way he did, and coming back to be a productive player, I just, the chances of that guy turning into a high end player are pretty high, regardless of whether, like, oh, he didn't hit the ball that hard or hit the ball on the ground too much. I don't really, I don't worry about that too much. Now, when the price is 110th overall, <coughs> it's a little iffy, but. If I'm going to bet on people in the outfield at this range, yeah. I'd rather it be the 21 year old who held more than held his own as a rookie. No, that's a great point because this is, this is the beginning of the yuck in the outfield. And I mean, you could look at Lane Thomas and Chaz McCormick from this tier, a couple of 2020 guys. I think McCormick got all the way to 2020, right? Um, if not, it was just a, if not, it would, if not, he was close. Yeah. He didn't have quite enough at bats. But we don't really buy the un the skills underlying those mm -hmm. seasons for Lane Thomas and Chaz McCormick. And so I think they're fine in this range, but it's not like you draft them feeling good about, okay, I got I got that outfield spot filled all year. Um, and Jordan Walker, you don't necessarily either, but you expect the, the trend line to go up with him while you tr expect it to go down for those others. And trend line going down i mean you could say the same for jorge soler because of his injury risk you could say the same for tj friedel because of another skills issue um oh we haven't gotten that far yet right we haven't gotten that far into the tier no but we've got to pick it up because there's a lot of names still to get to uh, yeah 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 the next six players within the fallback options tier cedric mullins eloy jimenez who is util only as well anthony santander ian happ brendan nimmo and the aforementioned tj friedel I get everybody is just collectively done with Eloy Jimenez, but his ADP is currently 219, which just kind of seems crazy to me. Uh, Cedric Mullins could be a steal in this tier. He is one year removed from hitting 16 home runs with 34 steals. Took a step back last year, but only played 116 games dealing with a recurring groin injury. Scott, how much do you think those struggles were due to the injury versus real steps back for Cedric Mullins? I think I could buy the argument that the groin had something to do with it, but I, I'm leaning more towards Cedric Mullins just isn't that great. I mean, he had the, the, the 30, 30 season in 2021 that shocked us all and had him ranked among the elite the following year. And his home run production was cut in half the next year. And there's just, other than the fact he runs fast, there's just not a lot in the skill set to like here. And now the Orioles are breaking in all this new young talent more than they can fit in the lineup. And Cedric Mullins, uh, I'm, I'm not confident he's even going to be an everyday player. I, his steals aren't as valuable anymore in the current environment. And I question the playing time. And I mm -hmm. don't think there's much bat power or batting average help there. So I'm, I, I couldn't invest more than this in Cedric Mullins. That's for sure. The next six names in the fallback options, James Outman, Tommy Edmond, J.D. Martinez, also util only, also remains a free agent. Esteuri Ruiz, Kerry Carpenter, and Jaron Duran. Um, Outman and Ruiz are both one tier lower in a head-to-head -head points league. Outman strikes out a lot, over 30% of the time. And Ruiz, mostly a steel specialist uh, so far in his career. And we'll just start there. Chris, Esther Ruiz, 67 steals last year, the second most in baseball behind Acuna. Is there any way that you see yourself drafting Esther Ruiz in 2024? Uh, was, was, um, was Billy Hamilton before your time, Frank, certainly on the podcast, but like, no, it, it's part of like my fantasy baseball career. Definitely before I was here though. Yeah. It, it because th that's basically what Esther Ruiz is. I mean, he might actually be a better hitter than Billy Hamilton, which says something about how bad Billy Hamilton was. But yeah, it, it's just a, a question of how valuable is the odds on favor to lead the league in steals? I don't know if he's actually the odds on favorite, but I, I would probably say he should be. Um but the thing about this whole tier, I mean, every time, every name we're saying is like, yeah, that guy might not be a starter 
by June. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that guy might not be a starter by June. Yeah, that guy might not be. So it's yeah. that's it's sort of like at least you know what Ruiz is going to do, right? Like, the, well, no, no, I was actually going to say the the biggest knock of all on Ruiz for me is that mm -hmm. by the end of last year, not even the A's could justify playing him every day. Yep. That's exactly right. And something I was going to point out earlier too, like talking about the depth within the outfield, obviously there are tons of players because whatever, every team has three outfielders, but the way that baseball has trended the past couple of years, specifically in the outfield, there's more platoons than mm -hmm. ever before at that position. So we just don't have as many full-time players in mm -hmm. the outfield for fantasy as we do other positions. And Outman, Duran, yeah. Yeah. And, and that's part of what kind of limits the upside at this position. With that being said, I do kind of like Jaron Duran as a breakout candidate this year. I wrote, wrote him up in breakouts 1.0. Uh, I think Kerry Carpenter kind of already broke out, but if he does what he did over a full season, then, you know, obviously that's even yeah. bigger of a breakout, which I think mm -hmm. is possible I, for someone like Kerry Carpenter. Kerry Carpenter and, and Jaron Duran stand out in this range as two players I would target if I felt like I was behind in the outfield at this point in the draft. All right. Yeah, I mean, all, all he has to do, all Kerry Carpenter has to do is just kind of what he's done at the major league level, right? 149 games, 26 homers. Runs and RBI numbers have been pretty bad, 74 and 73. But if he just does that, you're going to feel decent about that with like a 270-ish batting average. And a non-zero chance that he could chip in like 10 steals. 10 steals, yeah. Yeah, he's been kind of fast. Did want to quickly pull up his splits for his career. Yeah, against lefties, batting 231 with a 643 OPS. So uh, that's know. not quite at that. Don't, don't be rude. Like, Jaron Duran was pretty good against lefties last year. He was good. Yeah. He just, it's 49 play appearances. So yeah. who, who the heck knows? That's exactly right. The final six names in this fallback options tier Lars Nupar, Stephen Kwan, Masataka Yoshida, Jung Hu Lee, who came over from uh, Korea. And we do have Byron Buxton, util only, but expected to play center field. So should likely earn outfield eligibility. And of course, we can't forget Chris's man crush, Riley Green, who we spoke about extensively last week. Scott, each of Newt Bar, Kwan, Yoshida, and Lee all feel like they could be head-to-head -head points league specialists, uh, standouts rather, I guess. And mm -hmm. in the case of Kwan, Yoshida, and Lee, those are three names that could potentially give you batting average contribution in a categories league after picks pick 170, which obviously once we get to that point, like there's really not many names that could help you in batting average, but those are three that stand out mid to late round options that could help batting average. Yeah. It's a major concession because they're not helping in much of anything else. Right. Juan gives you some speed, Yoshida, modest power, but it's, you'd rather have batting average taken care of. So you don't have to fall back on these guys in that format. But I do like them a lot more in points leagues. If the tier was smaller, then, um, yeah, I mean, if, if I divided up these this big tier of fallback options into points leaguers and categories leaguers, it would look very different. There's a lot of, the order changes depending on what format you're in. All right, we are on to the last resorts tier. That's right. We're not even up to the final tier at outfield yet. 24 names in this tier, and we'll do something similar. We'll do uh, groups of six again, and we'll start with Sal Freelich, Christopher Morell, Starling Marte, Giancarlo Stanton, Alex Verdugo, and Jared Kelnick. Wait, did you miss the first two? Let's see. Did I? Hmm. Uh, I, I don't know. Aren't the first two Tyler O'Neill and Jared Kelnick? I have... Sal Freelich and Christopher Morell. I have Tyler mm. O'Neill going later on in the tier. What? Yeah, what same with there. Kelnick. Did it not I, update? I need to check that because because okay. it should be Tyler O'Neill and Jared Kelnick at the front of the tier. But go ahead. Okay. I you literally copy and paste it from the article, Scott. So. Yeah, I, I guess it didn't. Up, I thought I went in there and updated it, but okay. Never okay. mind. Go ahead. Uh, so again, the names that I mentioned: Sal Freelich, Christopher Morell, Starling Marte, Giancarlo Stanton, Alex Verdugo, and Jared Kelnick. Chris. We do see some post-hype names here in Freelich and Kelnick, some potential bounce backs in Marte and Stanton, if they could stay healthy, of course. Uh, Morel has upside. Verdugo gets Yankee Stadium in a contract year. I, I think some of these names are kind of interesting. You know, the, like Again, the back half of outfield, like there are some interesting names, but obviously they come with a ton of concerns, and that's why they're ranked where they are. Yeah, what was the question? 
There are no questions. It's okay. Very <laughs> interesting names. <laughs> I yeah. I I don't know. Uh, it, uh, that that might be generous. <laughs> I have Freelick as a as a sleeper, but like the the Freelick sleeper case is like maybe he could be Stephen Kwan, but like the good first half twenty twenty one or twenty twenty two Stephen Kwan, where you know it was a really good source of batting average and. Like th- that's what I'm hoping for there. I-, I don't have a ton of optimism about the the six specifically that we're talking about here. Kalnick, I just I don't think he's going to be able to hit lefties. He he really fell apart after like what May last year, and so I I don't have a ton of optimism here. I, I think Frelick Frelick is I don't know if I would say my favorite, but the one I'm likely to draft the most at at cost because his his ADP is pretty low but yeah i don't have a ton of faith in in anyone in this tier certainly the next six includes dalton varsho lourdes Gurriel, taylor ward whit merrifield who remains a free agent tyler o'neill and nelson velasquez those last two names are scott tyler o'neill two years removed from uh 34 homers 15 steals also in a contract year here in fenway park Nelson Velasquez, I mean, the guy crushed 17 home runs in like a really small amount of time. So I, I think there is some power upside uh, with him as well. Yes, there is. I don't see him being much more than a specialist, though. Velasquez, I'm talking about. Um, O'Neill could be more, obviously. He was, he was more in 2021. And could- Fenway Park has... Go ahead, Chris. I know you got an interesting stat here. So, sorry. Uh, yeah, it's so Tyler O'Neill has underperformed his expected Woba by a significant amount. The past two seasons, he's been above 330 in X Woba each of the last two seasons, below 315 in each of them. Over the past five seasons, right-handed hitters at Bush Stadium, Bush Stadium is that what it's called? Yeah, yeah. Uh, have underperformed their Woba, their expected Woba by 15 points. At Fenway, right-handed hitters have overperformed by 12. That's a pretty significant gap between those two. So, mm-hmm. you know, maybe that can help Tyler O'Neill overcome some of the, the, I don't know if it's bad luck or underperformance that he's had the past couple of years. Yeah. And, you know, we've seen other cases of the, the, the sort of right-handed masher do that at Fenway park, Hunter Renfro and, um, out of all and out. But part of why I'm not all in on that for Tyler O'Neill is I, I think people mostly blame injury for the way the last two years have gone. But he just hasn't hit the ball nearly as hard mm-hmm. as he did in that 2021 20, season. And maybe that's injury related too, but it's it's a skill issue on top of the injury issue that makes it even more questionable. The next six names, Jake Fraley, Jeff McNeil, Chris Bryant, Garrett Mitchell, Matt Walner, and Leody Tavares. Uh, Walner, someone who also has huge power, similar to Nelson Velasquez. My guess is strong side platoon for the Twins. And I feel like Tavares is sneaky. He's 25 years old, 14 homers, 14 steals last year. Uh, hits the ball hard. Awesome center fielder. So my guess is he will get every opportunity to play for the Rangers this year. Uh, Chris, any interest in those last two? Walner, big power. Uh, Tavares, a little power and speed. Yeah, I think Tavares is pretty interesting as a as a cheap power speed guy. Walner, it, it, it's just like they clone Joey Gallo. I mean, up to like the way he looks and the way he swings, it, it, it it's kind of wild. He's a little less beefy, I guess. But yeah, I think he's a he's a, a fun ish player. And look, like Chris Bryant has been pretty disastrous uh, so far. But it wouldn't surprise me if we got like. We've gotten a couple of dead count cat bounce seasons from Charlie Blackman where it looked like he was done and he ended up being more useful than expected for fantasy. It wouldn't shock me if we got something like that from Chris Bryant. Yeah. They're, they move him to first base this year. Yeah. And hopefully, hopefully that helps him stay healthy. Yeah. Right. Hopefully that takes less of a toll. Yeah. But yeah. Uh, you can't draft him expecting it. No. And th- the price is so low too. I mean, everyone kind of like Eloy Jimenez, I mentioned earlier, people have just like, written Chris Bryant completely off at this point. Final six names in the last resorts tier. Hunter Renfro, Austin Hayes, MJ Melendez, Jack Sawinski, Henry Davis, and Brendan Donovan. No analysis on those because I do just want to quickly wrap up. 
Uh, the leftovers tier features 46 names. <laughs> For the sake of the audience, I'm not going to read those names off, but uh, I asked you guys beforehand, just give me two or three names from this tier. I mean, we're talking real deep league stuff here. That might interest you. Scott, you get the first word. William Abreu interests me a lot, I think. I don't really get the lack of enthusiasm for him, particularly within prospect circles, since he still qualifies as a prospect. Great on base skills. Uh, had a power breakout in the minors last year that carried over to the majors. His swing seems well suited for power, elevates and pulls the ball well, and uh, had a really good debut for the Red Sox. He bats left handed, so there is a platoon risk there, and I'm assuming he'll begin the year in a platoon. But if he breaks out of that platoon, he could be a very surprising player for fantasy. Do you want me to keep going or stop with him? That's fine, Chris. Okay. A, a name or two. Uh, I'll double up on twins. I like Alex Kirilov and Max Kepler. I think, you know, obviously Kirilov has to stay healthy coming off shoulder surgery. The good news is as far as I know, the surgery was very minor. It was a cleanup procedure in his shoulder. It didn't find any uh, significant damage that they had to repair. So hopefully, you know, he, he hit the ball pretty well last season. It's just obviously a question of staying healthy. And then Kepler, uh, added like what 2.8 miles per hour to his average exit velocity last season, tightened up his launch angle, led to a career high expected batting average. Like he's always been someone who had to pull the, I can only hit for power. If I sacrifice batting average thing last year showed some signs of changing that in a way that if he can back that up could be really interesting. All right. I agree with you, Scott on uh Willier Abreu. I had him written down here. Uh, Parker Meadows with the Tigers. He went nearly 2020 back to back seasons in the minors. Obviously, has some bloodlines there with uh, Austin Meadows as well. And Jose Siri, freakish tools, awesome fielder. He's got some power and speed. He also has a 36% <laughs> strikeout rate. So uh, it's a really bad batting average, but I do think there is some power and speed there from Jose Siri. Let's take our final break. When we return, we're going to go a little bit longer. We're going to talk about some news and notes, some Hall of Fame stuff. We'll do that right after this. The biggest event in sports is coming to the entertainment capital of the world. CBS Sports HQ will have you covered every minute, getting you set with all the critical analysis you need. Ready, set, Vegas. All right, let's wrap up with some news and notes. And uh, we did have a smaller move that we didn't get to yesterday. There might not be any analysis needed. The Nationals signed Joey Gallo to a one-year, $5 million deal with $1 million in incentives. Does this matter at all, guys? It could. I mean, he's it, if there's any team that offers him a chance to resuscitate his value, it's that one. They're, they're going to play him, and we'll see how it goes. It's probably his last chance. Yeah, we did see, obviously, Jamer Candelario have a breakout season playing every day. Lane Thomas just did it as well, so... Yeah, he will he get the, the ball very hard, Gallo. He just doesn't hit it nearly enough. No, no. 43% strikeout rate last year. Uh, completely untenable. Hopefully he can get that down a little bit. Angels GM Perry Manassian said on Tuesday that Carlos Estevez remains the team's closer on paper, even after signing Robert Stevenson. Uh, to that, I would say plans, Find you. plans change. Well, and wasn't wasn't the, the quote officially like, but that's ultimately the the manager's decision. Yeah, that's yeah. exactly right. Yep. Find you someone who, find you someone who loves you as much as Perry Manesian loves Carlos Estevez because he's been singing that tune ever since he signed him to the perplexion of everybody. Yeah, there have been three drafts completed at the NFBC since the Stevenson signing was announced, uh, and his ADP is two oh seven point three, Estevez two forty six point seven. So. Stevenson is kind of cruising on by, and I have a feeling that's going to continue to climb as well. Speaking of the Angels' bullpen, they signed Matt Moore to a one-year $9 million deal coming off a surprisingly strong season for him. He does have 36 holds over the past two years, so for anyone who plays in a holds league or a league that has that category, Matt Moore might be a name you need to know. The Yankees are tentatively planning for Juan Soto to bet second and Aaron Judge to bet third in the lineup. Aaron Boone indicated that he'd like to see DJ LeMahieu win the team's leadoff spot. Uh, Boone also mentioned Verdugo and Gleyber Torres as potential leadoff candidates. Does this matter at all for you guys? Soto second, what? Judge third. 
Juan Soto is going to be a monster this year. I mean, the amount of runs he's going to score batting ahead of Aaron Judge, that that alone, in addition to the, the, the rebound I expect him to have now that he's out of San Diego and in New York, it's just, it's, I, I think we're all going to look back and say we undervalued him. Speaking of the Yankees, Brian Cashman said last week that Carlos Rodon has already reported to spring training and that Rodon, quote, looks really good physically. I saw a picture where uh, he did look noticeably slimmer for whatever that's worth. And Scott, I know you wrote up Rodon in your sleepers 1.0. Rodon's ADP this offseason, 173.4. We all remember what he did in 21 and 22 where he pitched like a top 10, top 12 pitcher in fantasy baseball it's just uh can he get healthy once again here with has he, has he shaved the mustache i feel uh, like i think it, it was right. such it was such a bad look for him i think the picture i saw is uh he still had it okay he, he looked uh, he looked like every dude in bushwick like you go over to birdies and just every guy looks like that it was not a good look for Carlos for i really i really think he needs to get rid of it if he wants to wants to succeed hot take Mustache is a bad look for every guy. Oh, uh, mustache there are alone. Some, no other facial hair, just a mustache. There are some guys who can pull it off, but it's it's pretty rare. That sounds like uh, words from someone who can't grow a mustache, Scott. Mm. Oh, <laughs> well, I do I do better under the nose than on the cheeks. I, <laughs> I think I think I could get a decent mustache going well there's only one way to prove me wrong scott mm. dylan cease is unlikely to be traded anytime soon according to Mar mark F feinsand of mlb.com jonathan india could apparently see time at first base and or left field this upcoming season just kind of adds more to the mystery i guess the Reds Ho lineup. hopefully not in cincinnati right the other reds news noel v Marte, who suffered a hamstring strain in the dominican winter league will be ready for the start of spring training so that's good Rangers prospect Justin Foscue has a chance to break camp with the team. According to Jeff Wilson of Rangers today, Foscue turns 25 in March. He's a former first round pick from back in 2020. Has flashed some power and speed in the minors. I think more telling, Scott, within that same article, this uh, gentleman, Jeff Wilson, mentioned Wyatt Langford could be unlikely for opening day because the team doesn't want to start his career as a DH. What do you think? Be unlikely for opening day. It's an interesting phrasing there. Um, the the one knock on White Langford is that his defense isn't up to the standard of his offense. And given that the Rangers already have a full outfield, I could see that. I still think like they could get creative. They could rotate everybody, all of their outfielders through the DH spot to give White Langford some reps there, and the the draft pick incentive i think is going to have the final say here and i i i give i give langford better than 50 50 odds of making the major league roster though not much better than 50 50 odds all right brian bayo has been working on commanding his slider during the offseason and plans on making it quote a significant part of his pitch mix this upcoming season tristan mckenzie told reporters that he's feeling great and has been slowly increasing intensity this offseason Chris, both Bayo and McKenzie, I do think have some sleeper appeal, and they're both going outside the top 225 picks. Yeah, I mean, remember, McKenzie was a top 100 pick this time a year ago, so he's definitely someone that I like betting on as a very cheap bounce back candidate. Bayo, I don't know how much that's like. It, obviously, a, a reliable third pitch is good for any pitcher, but his biggest issue last year was he just got demolished by left-handed pit batters. He gave up an 883 to left o OPS to lefties last year. Is a slider going to change that? I'm not so sure. It's has, weird because he has such a good change up. Right. That's the thing is you yeah, would think, yeah. I, I think the bigger problem uh, is sinkers tend to be especially bad against same handed uh, or opposite handed hitters. And he throws his sinker. I mean, less against lefties, but, it was still a big problem. Both of his fastballs were. So I don't know. Uh, I, it, it's just to say that I'm not sure that fixes his biggest issue. Um, but 226 ADP is fine. 
Yeah, so the changeup against lefties last year for Bayo it was incredible. Was really good. 48 batting average against 34.5% whiff rate. Here are the batting averages on his fastball, sinker, and slider. 333, 341, 370. <laughs> 248, I wouldn't consider great anyway. I mean, given yeah. the context. I, I, I think, think the expected Woba against was like 280 or something, which is very good. That is very good. Yeah. Uh, next up, the Angels and Red Sox are in the bidding for free agent Adam Duvall, which I don't love to hear because, Scott, we both like Willie Herbreu, so do not want to see Adam Duvall back with the Red Sox. The Brewers invited four of their top prospects to Major League Spring Training. Starting pitchers Jacob Mizierowski and Robert Gasser, plus infielders Tyler Black and Brock Wilkin. Wilkin was a, a draft pick just last year. I think there's a real chance that Tyler Black and Robert Gasser could both be on the Brewers opening day roster. And those are names that need to be on your radar for fantasy. Does Gasser throw hard? Look, with a name like that, he can't fail. Uh, actually, no. He's more of a... <laughs> he's more of a... I don't know what the term is, but... It's an it's an ironic name. Soft lefty. lefty. Yeah. All right. But he has pitched well at times in the minors, so I think he's probably a name that needs to be on radars. The Guardians invited Kyle Manzardo to Major League Spring Training. He's expected to compete with Rule 5 Draft Edition. Davison De Los Santos, who did have some big power in the minors, but struck out a lot. Lastly, guys, the Hall of Fame. I don't know. I don't know. We talk about it every year. Some people really get up in arms and all crazy about the Hall of Fame. Congratulations <laughs> to the newest additions. Adrian Beltre, Joe Maurer, and Todd Helton, obviously all very well deserving. I guess his Billy Wagner will probably be in next year. Mm -hmm. But truly a shame, in my opinion, that Gary Sheffield did not make it on his 10th year on the ballot. So, Gary yeah, it, yeah. Go ahead. Sheffield, Go ahead. watching him play, he was a Hall of Famer. Yeah. There, there was no question when he was playing. It's, it's just PEDs, and I, I get it. If he wasn't as good as Manny Ramirez or Alex Rodriguez, who are also not going to get into the Hall of Fame, so it's like, well, it's tough. Those guys failed. failed they actually got suspended. Test. Yeah, I mean, yes. I, I think the Gary Sheffield PED. Um, my understanding is the connection there is pretty thin. So, I, well, he's I, admitted to it. He admitted to inadvertently taking. Uh, something when he was training with Barry Bonds. Oh, okay. It was like a cream that was applied to an injured knee. Okay. Yes. Well, I wasn't familiar with that, but so that makes that makes. I, I'm kind of surprised he got as close as he did. If that's the case. Yeah, um, I mean, he's been closer than Manny, or and then so that's the thing where it's like Manny and A Rod were better players. Well, you know, I mean, he got he got that much closer than Sammy Sosa for good. Yeah, right, Sammy Sosa. The 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 connections are are even more tenuous. Right. So, I, I mean, Gary Sheffield might have been the fiercest right hand, the most terrifying right handed hitter of my lifetime. Yeah. There are, I mean, you could put McGuire Sosa in there, obviously. You could put Manny Ramirez, Albert Pujols. Bell, but like, Pujols. It, it's Carrera, not even, sure. but, but I think terrifying is the right word. There, <laughs> there were better right handed hitters. Nobody was just as, like, as terrifying on like a gut level. As Gary Sheffield in the box. And and so much emphasis is on the strength and the power and the bat waggle and deservedly, but he was just such a good all like you go look at his strikeout to walk rates throughout his career. Yeah, the it's guy, wild. For, Crazy. for having that bat waggle, he mm -hmm. hardly ever struck out. And he he got on base so much just just by on base skills. Uh, you could make a case for Gary Sheffield. On base skills and longevity, you could make a case for him as a Hall of Famer. And mm -hmm. uh, yeah, it's a shame that he, it, I, I didn't think he'd ever get as close as he did. Yeah. And it's a shame that he came so close and didn't make it in on the final year. But just um, a moment to sell it. I mean, Adrian Beltre, there was no question that guy was getting in. And anybody who didn't think that guy was getting in, I find him and Joe Maurer going into the Hall of Fame so fitting because they're like two completely divergent paths to the Hall of Fame. Like Adrian Beltre had basically one great season before he turned 30. He was in the majors as a 20 year old, I think, but he really only had like the one huge year. And then he had a couple of other very good years, but then like he turned 30 and was just like 850 OPS, 900 OPS every year with elite defense. And he was an elite defensive player his whole career. Joe Maurer was just so 
obviously blindingly brilliant in his 20s that he basically added nothing to his career after the age of 30 and he still got into the Hall of Fame. It, it, he's, I don't know if he's the best hitting catcher of all time because Josh Gibson and Mike Piazza, but he's in the discussion for sure. And I mean, winning three batting titles as a catcher is just bonkers. Only, I think, seven catchers have won a batting title. There have been seven catcher batting titles of all ever, and he has three of them. It's yep. Joe Maurer was one of my favorite players when he was when he was active. I I thought he probably should have won at least two MVP awards. And I think you can make a case that he should have won a third one. Uh, the one Justin Morneau won, I think he probably should have won as well. He he was so good. And then Todd Helton, not just a course field thing. All right. This, this dude had like an 870 OPS away from course field or something in his career. He he was an outstanding player. I'm I'm so happy. I always want to see a bigger Hall of Fame class. I think we should have three or four players going in every year, pretty much. And uh, I'm thrilled that these three guys made it. Yeah, shout out to all three again. Adrian Beltre, Joe Maurer, Todd Helton, the newest additions of the MLB Hall of Fame. Let's hope Andrew Jones gets in next year. Let's go, Scotty. Andrew Jones, I'm I'm with it. Let's go. We're going to wrap there for Scott and Chris. I am Frank. Thanks, as always, for tuning in to Fantasy Baseball today. Please make sure to follow and leave a five-star rating on Apple or Spotify. And we'll be back again next week. Bye-bye.